Uh, Sandy gave me too much credit for developing all of this uh, job guarantee stuff, so I have to uh, make it very clear that uh, I was not... I mean, the job guarantee literature, the idea of the employer of last resort, which is what Minsky and others have called it in the past, is not, is not new in the history of economic thought. Um, the earliest people who really started to worry about involuntary unemployment, it started at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. David Ricardo, when he wrote the third edition of his Principles of Political Economy, very easy name to remember because they all wrote Principles of Political Economy, he made sure to add a final chapter, chapter 35, I think, in which he started to describe the effects of the Industrial Revolution. Machines replacing people. Sounds familiar? The robots are coming. He saw it coming too. And he started worrying about involuntary unemployment as one of the major issues that capitalism will have to deal with. Unfortunately, the rest of the economics discipline doesn't read the third edition, you know, even less the, the last chapter, but focuses on the other side of Ricardo. So had he lived long enough to live with Marx, maybe, he would probably be closer to Marx than, than free market, you know, economics type of uh, textbooks. Um, so after Ricardo, there was, a, and he talked about the idea of finding employment, finding useful employment to eliminate involuntary, um, involuntary unemployment because of the negative social costs of unemployment and the negative psychological uh, and public health costs of unemployment, in addition to the wasted potential, economic output potential. So the idea is not new. Uh, in the United States, Hyman Minsky made the idea popular at least try to make it popular in, in the economics literature, by arguing that the war on poverty in the United States was actually a war on the poor. It wasn't a war on poverty. It wasn't addressing the root causes of poverty and all the negative social effects of, uh, of poverty. Um, so in, in that context, he wanted to introduce the job guarantee as or the employer of last resort as a way of addressing the root causes of poverty. Um, and then, of course, there's uh, Randy Ray and Bill Mitchell and Stephanie Kelton and the entire, you know, MMT generation that, that came, uh, you know, way before me. Um, my interest in this and the job guarantee started in, in grad school. I was a student with Randy Ray and uh, Matt Forstatter and Stephanie was there and spent a summer with or a winter, I guess, with Bill Mitchell. And this whole discussion of MMT and job guarantee just made me excited, but at the same time frustrated because I come from a developing country and my question is like, how does this work for a developing country that has all kinds of problems? So my work sort of shifted towards trying to learn how developing countries' systems function from an MMT perspective and show how a job guarantee program can address some of the deficiencies. But I'm not going to bother you with developing countries today. I'm going to try to focus as much as possible on on countries that have full financial sovereignty in, in the UK in particular. So here, here are the, the main things that all progressives and even some conservatives want to, want to achieve. We want decent jobs and with living wages and benefits, high quality education, high quality health care, you know, environmental, uh, you know, green infrastructure, efficient public transportation systems, all of these things are sort of what we aspire to achieve in any decent society. And then we're told, it's too bad, we can't afford it. You know, how do we pay for this stuff? We're told that, you know, governments are broke, we're running out of cash. You know, President Obama famously said, we, we don't have dollars, we run out of dollars. We can't afford all of these things. He ran on a campaign saying, yes, we can. And then as soon as he got in office, he said, no, we can't. We ran out of dollars. I checked, we don't have cash. Um, uh, which, is, uh, which is really sad to, to, for, for his presidency. Um, we're told that the rich will never agree to pay higher taxes because we're, we're taught that, you know, governments need to raise tax revenues in order to spend, right? This is the sound finance principles. And then we're told that if the government starts spending, it was going to cause inflation, hyperinflation, and, and that's even more destructive than, than anything. But then we have the idea of MMT, modern monetary theory, which is a, a label that none of us created, I guess. The MMT hashtag took off 
when some blogger made it made it popular. So now we're stuck with the term. I I don't like the the T part of the the MMT because it's as you'll see in a, in a few minutes. It's really a descriptive framework. I'd rather call it MMD as in description or modern money system or modern money analysis. Uh, the modern money part is also you know coming from a developing country in a post colonial context. Uh, the concept of modern, modernity is, is not a very comfortable concept to begin with. Um, so I have, I have issues with the title. I have no problems with the analysis. Um, but the reference to modern money comes from Keynes, essentially referring to a modern monetary system as in the last 3,000 or 4,000 years, right? Not, not as in modern as in the, after the Enlightenment. Um, so, I'm, so I'm comfortable with the term coming from that context. Um, so what is, what is the idea of behind modern money theory? It's really the idea of governments, some governments, having full monetary sovereignty or full financial sovereignty. Um, so if I say full financial sovereignty or full monetary sovereignty, this is what I mean. These four bullet points. It's a country that issues its own currency, like in the UK, the British pound, in the US, the US dollar. That's easy. Any country can do that, right? Second, it's a country that collects taxes in that same currency, so in the sovereign currency of the state. So in the UK, I don't think you can pay your taxes in anything other than British pounds. In the US, you can't pay with Canadian dollars. It has to be US dollars. And so the second point is also easy. Any government can do this. Develop, developing countries, most countries can do this. Some countries decided not to print their own currency at all, right? Like the Eurozone countries or Ecuador countries that completely dollarize. But those are, those are exceptions. The third and fourth points on the list here are extremely important, especially for developing countries. So the third point is that a country never issues bonds or guilds, I guess you say here, that are denominated in a foreign currency. In other words, the national government doesn't borrow and promise to pay back in a foreign currency. Because a foreign currency, you can't print it. You have to earn it. And the only way to earn it is through a trade surplus or through some other mechanism, foreign direct investment, tourism, somehow generating a surplus through international, um, uh, international trade. And that's where developing countries lose their financial sovereignty because of structural deficiencies in their economies. They end up importing more what, than what they export. And that starts putting pressure on their exchange rate, hence the fourth point. And when you devalue the exchange rate, it essentially forces you in a situation where you'll be importing goods and services at a much higher cost. So you're importing inflation, and that has severe consequences in developing countries, especially when it has to do with food and fuel. That could fuel a lot of social unrest and political unrest. So countries that enjoy full financial sovereignty, they never borrow and promise to pay back in a foreign currency. And as a result, they don't have the same kind of pressure to stabilize their exchange rate. So if you use a flexible exchange rate regime, then you have full financial sovereignty, which, mean, which means you can manage your finances in a very different way than I manage my personal finances or a company manages its own personal finances or a local municipality or a state manages their own uh, finances. So the third point, which deals with the national debt, when the national debt is completely denominated in the national currency, it can always be managed, and I'll, I'll talk about the details. But when, the, when a portion of the national debt is denominated in foreign currencies, that's the portion that has to be, that, that's the portion that represents a real burden on that particular economy, because you have to earn it you know, through trade in order to pay off that portion of, of the debt. And I'll, I'll come back to this point. So the main distinction that we want to keep in mind, if, if you want to introduce MMT to your friends, this is the part that you really need to stress. The distinction between the issuer of the currency, which is the UK government in this case, versus the users of the currency, which would be everybody else, you know, individual households, companies, NGOs, foreign entities, they're users of the, UK, of the British pound. So distinguish between the issuer and the user. The issuer of the currency is, is the government that has full financial sovereignty, will operate in a completely different financial space in terms of principles from the rest of us, because the rest of us, we have to earn income first, then spend it, whereas the issue of the currency spends the currency into existence. 
There is no way anybody in this room would have British pounds in their pockets unless it has been spent into existence first by the legal issuer of the currency. So the, the sequence of events that we usually think of when we think of finances are actually turned around now. Because we usually think from an individual perspective, we say, well, first I have to work hard, earn an income, then I can spend it. And if I want to spend beyond my monthly income, then I need to borrow from a bank or from a friend or from somebody. So now I have a debt that I have to work hard next month or next year to pay it off. I have to reduce my spending or earn a little bit more so I can pay off my bills. That's from a personal level, it's absolutely true. From a corporate level, absolutely true. You have to earn income in order to spend. And if you borrow, you borrow up to a limit and then you have to work hard and pay it off. But for the issuer of the currency, it's completely the other way around. First, the issuer has to issue the currency into existence by spending. And then the taxing part comes later, right? So how can you tax the population without the money is, without the money being already in circulation, right? How can you borrow from a population if the money is not there yet, right? Because if the UK government is selling gills or selling treasuries, government bonds, it's taking cash out of circulation, right? So the cash has to exist in the system first. So now from an MMT perspective, there's only one way for money to enter the system. That's when the government spends money into existence. And there are two ways for money to leave the system or to be removed from the system. One is coercive and one is more friendly. The coercive way is taxation because you can't argue with that. You have to pay the tax, right? That's the coercive power of the state. The second option of removing money from circulation is, is more friendly is when the government is selling bonds or guilds or treasuries and offering to pay you interest. Right? And that's, that's more friendly and that's, and that's more, more popular. And yet we, most people think of it as a, as a problem. Right? We don't think of it as a saving account option right, for the population. So these are, these are the main distinctions that we want to carry with us because it will have tremendous consequences in terms of how do we pay for a job guarantee? How do we pay for healthcare? How do we pay for education? Um, because if, if you're thinking we're going to pay for it in the same way I pay for my expenses, then we have a problem. But if you're thinking of it from a sovereign currency issuer perspective, then, then there's plenty of policy space and there's plenty of possibilities. There are limits and I'll talk about the limits. I'm not saying that the government can spend unlimited quantities. And you'll never hear any MMP economist tell you there's no limit to, to printing money and, and spending money. There are limits, and the limits are inflationary limits. And inflation and the inflationary pressure is determined by real resources, the availability of real resources and productive capacity, which, we'll, which I'll talk about today in the context of, for example, providing uh, health care. Uh, the, there's big debates here in the UK about you know, NHS and its financial resources and can we afford it and should we privatize bits and pieces of it. Um, so I'll, I'll address that a little bit today. Um, so this, this slide, I think I, I just said what I said earlier, so <laughs> I'm not going to bother you with, with repeating these ideas. But, it, but it's really distinguishing between issuer and users and recognizing that selling government bonds is not required to finance government operations. It's the other way around. When you think of the logic of the creation of the monetary system, money is created into existence first through spending, then it's withdrawn from the system through taxation or through, or through bond sales or treasury sales. So then the question is, if the government doesn't need our money to spend on government programs, then why does the government borrow from us? Right? Well, borrowing is really the, the wrong term. Because, yeah, the government doesn't need to borrow its own currency. If I had a you know, printing press in my office, why do I need to borrow my money from you? Right? I can just create more of it. So if you put a lot of money in circulation beyond you know, reasonable limits, you're essentially giving consumers purchasing power. So what do consumers do with, with the money they have? They spend it. They go on a shopping spree. So they start buying housing and you know food and entertainment and transportation, all kinds of things. 
which is good. We, you want people to spend their money. You want people to buy health care and education, all kinds of things. But if the physical productive capacity of the country, of the economy, is not able to provide those resources, then you have lots of people with lots of cash bidding up prices. And that causes inflation that could cause hyperinflation. Right? So before we can say we want to offer free health care, free education, free everything to everybody, we have to make sure, not that we have the money, because we do have the money, the government meaning has the money, but we have to make sure that we actually have enough doctors and nurses and teachers and equipment in schools and hospitals to actually to deliver the services that consumers will be looking for. Otherwise, we're guaranteeing that we're going to set up an inflationary spiral. So then the spending that the government does has to add not only to the demand side, but it has to add to the productive capacity. Now you're probably thinking UBI already, are you? Or is it just me? What does UBI do? Just adds to the demand, but doesn't generate any additional productive capacity. You know, in, in the best descriptions of UBI, people will tell you, well, maybe some of the UBI recipients will, you know, get their resources together and, you know, decide to start a new company in their garage and, and that will become the next big startup and that will create value in society. And there's always maybe underlined. That's not how you guarantee you, you have physical resources and productive capacity in the economy. So the job guarantee by design, if you target the spending in areas that not only add to the demand because you're hiring people and giving them wages and giving them purchasing power, but you're also making sure that you have the productive capacity to meet that demand. Now, the good news for countries like the US, the UK, Japan, Germany, all the industrialized developed countries, there's plenty of excess capacity to begin with. There's plenty of infrastructure already in place. You know, it can be better. You can add more. You can make it greener. There's, there's room there. But it's very different than the case of a developing country where you, you create jobs, you give people income, but then the productive capacity of the economy is not there. So you start importing more food, you start importing more equipment, you start importing more of everything. And that creates external debt and creates issues for developing countries. So the job guarantee in developing countries should be aimed at building the productive capacity as opposed to just providing income or any kind of uh, low productivity type of uh, type of jobs. But in the case of the, the UK, the US, there's plenty of uh, capacity in terms of productive capacity. There's plenty of capacity for research and innovation and research and development, which is even better. And there's plenty of capacity in terms of actual numbers of unemployment. I mean, if you, if you read the mainstream press in the U.S. or in the U.K., most people tell you, we're at full employment. Why do you want the job guarantee? Right? 4% or 3.9% is, is already full capacity. But as we'll see uh, later, at least the numbers for the U.K., we're not even close to full employment. Right? Because there's the official unemployment numbers that exclude... Uh, people who are working part-time but would rather be working full-time. Uh, it also excludes people who have been discouraged or have become inactive in the job market search because they didn't find anything in the last several months, so they give up looking. But if they're offered a job right now, they'll take it, right? So to um, was um, talking to Stephanie about this, uh, Stephanie Kelton the other day about this, and, and she said, well, if people think we're at full employment, then, then great, let's, let's do a job guarantee and see if anybody shows up. And if nobody shows up, then that's fine. Um, but if they do show up, then we need a job guarantee, and there's plenty of unemployment. Um, so that's, uh, that's really the, the beginning. So one of the main pictures that sometimes you'll see from MMT, and I borrowed this from Neil Wilson. I was hoping that he'll be here today to meet him. Uh, this is for the UK economy. So the three sector balances. So remember what I said earlier about the distinction between the issuer of the currency and the users of the currency? The issuer of the currency, every time the issuer of the currency spends money into existence, it will go to the users of the currency, either the users as in households or firms or foreign entities. So money doesn't just disappear. So the three sector balances uh, shows us that the balance of the government budget is by definition, and this is not by theory, this is not 
accounting truth, accounting identity. The balance of the government budget is by definition equal to the non-government sector balance. Non-government sector meaning private sector and foreign sector, right? There is no alien sector beyond that, right? So then you get this mirror image. If I take this, this picture and I fold it at the zero axis, it's, it's a perfect mirror, right? So what do we have here? We have the blue lines, the blue bars, are government sector balances. So notice all the blue bars mostly at the bottom. So those are government deficits. And the numbers here are as a percentage of GDP. So this is the UK government deficit as a percentage of GDP. There's a, a little bit of a, a surplus there. I think those are the, the Blair, Tony Blair years, right? Uh, but mostly deficits. And the picture is very similar for most governments. The governments typically run deficits. Occasionally, they run surpluses for a little bit of uh, time, but mostly deficits. Then you have the red bars are the rest of the world balances. So if you take the UK versus the rest of the world, the UK is exporting and importing with the rest of the world. The rest of the world in this case is having a surplus, which means the UK has a deficit with the rest of the world, right? So trade deficit, current account deficit. So now the yellowish, orangish looking uh, bars are the private sector in the UK. And when I say private sector, it's both households and firms in the UK. And that's it. Those are, those are all the players, the government sector and the non-government sector. And the non-government sector, either domestic firms and households or the rest of the world, foreign entities. And it always adds up to zero. So the balance of the government budget plus the balance of the foreign sector plus the balance of the private sector always adds up to zero. This is really the, if you wanted the, the equation to remember, this is, this is it. And this is true for any country, anywhere in the world, any year. And there's no disagreement here because this is just accounting. This is just raw data, right? So there's no theory about it. Uh, what we see here in the case of uh, the UK, for example, in, in recent years, notice what's happening to the private sector, the, the yellow or orange looking bars. They're in deficit. And it's driven primarily by household debt in the UK. Now, if you were, if you were running for office, prime minister, right, and you campaign and you tell your voters, Vote for me. I know how to get rid of the national debt and I'll reduce the deficit and I'll make sure that government is disciplined and it's spending and not wasteful and all of those good things. And they usually tell you because that's how you manage your finances responsibly. You know, responsible individuals balance their books and pay their bills and never go into unlimited debt, right? Act responsibly. And that's what you teach your children to be responsible with your finances. They say, I'll do the same when I go to, when I become prime minister or president or senator or whatever. And if you use this picture and use the MMT analysis and translate what they just said, using this information, they're saying, vote for me, I'll make sure the government has a surplus and I'll make sure you are in debt. Nobody will vote for them if they say it this way, but that's exactly what they're saying because there's this illusion that a lot of people have that somehow both the government can be in surplus and the private sector can be in surplus and everybody can be in surplus. It doesn't, it doesn't add up, right? Unless we're trading with a different planet and somehow that other planet has a deficit or something like that. But this is it. This is the data. So if you want to force that blue bar into the positive territory and have the government run a surplus, some, something has to give in. Either the red bars have to turn negative, and I don't think it has happened any time in, in recent history, so it's not going to happen the next year. Or the most likely scenario, those orange bars will get bigger and bigger to offset the blue bars going to the positive territory. Is this making sense? So uh, this, is, this is the first reality check for that distinction between the issuer of the currency and the users of the currency. And, and stopping this illusion that we have that government deficits are automatically just as bad as personal debt and personal deficit. 
my personal debt, my personal deficits are serious burdens, financial burdens, because I have to work hard and pay it off. Government debt is not the same thing. We shouldn't even be calling it government debt, right? Because it's the issue of, of the currency. Now, this is the national debt for the UK. You'll see a lot of scary commentaries about, about this, that we're going broke, that we can't afford it. But again, what is, what is the national debt? It's the sum total of all the treasuries or all the guilds that have been issued by the UK government, promising to pay back at some point in the future in 10 years, 20 years or whatever. Um, and those are financial assets held by the private sector. And some of it is held by foreign entities, but mostly the, the, pri the private sector. Um, we were talking earlier about the importance of U.S. Treasuries, the importance of, of guilds and government bonds, safe financial assets, AAA rated safe assets. If you're in financial markets, you want to have safe assets in your portfolio so you can leverage other riskier assets so you can, you can use them to, to move um, further away from that uh, risk-free uh, asset. But you do need these assets as an anchor for the system. And what we've noticed over the last uh, three or four decades is that the number of safe assets, U.S. Treasuries, guilds, and you know Japanese bonds, relative to the size of financial innovations, the financial instrument, has, has stayed relatively small. So you have a small anchor supporting a much, much larger global financial system with riskier and riskier and riskier assets. And that's creating a lot of instability at the, at the global level. So what we need is expanding the portfolio of safe assets that can only come from sovereign nations like the UK, like the US, like Japan, to provide financial investors and portfolio managers a safe anchor for the system. Otherwise, when they can't find a safe anchor, they go to the next best thing, which is a AAA rated mortgage backed security looking type of thing. And we know what happens with, with those things that look like AAA rated guaranteed by the government but they're not, they're not the same or, you know, guaranteed by AIG, the largest insurance company in the world. Who, who would think that the largest company in the world would, would go bankrupt? And yet we think that, you know, a financially sovereign, sovereign government, government that issues its own currency can go bankrupt. But we can't think of AIG going bankrupt. Right? So these are, these are kind of the, the myths that we, that we have to deal with. So the idea of the job guarantee. So if, if the government can afford to buy anything that's available uh, for sale in its own currency, then it can buy the services of the unemployed, those who are unemployed involuntarily. Right? We're not talking about you know, hiring workers away from existing companies. We're saying the private sector, you try to hire you know, whoever you need based on your uh, research, based on your skill needs and based on the needs of, of those companies. The nonprofit sector will also hire whatever it needs the main line government sector also hires whatever it needs. And then there is a pool of people remaining unemployed despite trying and trying and trying. The job guarantee will act as the employer of last resort for those who are ready, willing, and able to work but can't find work in the main line government sector, the private sector, or the nonprofit sector, and any of these options. The important thing to keep in mind about the job guarantee, and I, uh, Bill Mitchell and, and Minsky have, have brought this very important metaphor to explaining the job guarantee, which is the buffer stock mechanism. So what is, let me explain what a buffer stock, and then we'll realize why a job guarantee is absolutely necessary, and why it's not new, and why we know how to manage it because most countries have experimented with this in, in one way or another. So a buffer stock mechanism is usually a reference to commodities markets. So let's say you're in the United States and you're producing a lot of corn, a surplus of corn that can flood the entire world. You start you know, begging farmers to slow down, you pay them to slow down production, um, you, you know, but they, it's a very productive uh, industry. So what happens if farmers produce a massive surplus of corn? What happens to the price? It goes down. It can go to zero. It can destroy the industry, right? So what the government does is it buys the surplus of corn and stores it away. And there's buffer stocks for corn and wheat and coffee and all kinds of commodities that are produced in large surplus in, around the world. So you buy 
enough corn until the supply and demand for corn stabilize at a price that's reasonably profitable for farmers so that they can stay in business. So what do you do with the corn? You store it away. It's non-perishable. Um, you give some of it away to countries that experience na national natural disasters. You give away to countries that experience famines and wars and things like that. And there's plenty surplus. The idea of the buffer stock is stabilizing the price when there's a surplus. But also, a few years down the road, if there's a uh, crop failure, uh, if there's a fire, if there's a national you know, natural disaster that destroys output for that particular year, normally, without the buffer stock, production would be very low, demand is still high, so the price will go up to a level that's unaffordable for consumers. And that could create food price inflation. And that's when the buffer stock kicks in. So then the government steps in and acts as a seller of last resort and to sell enough of that amount that was stored away until the price of corn is cheap enough for consumers to afford it, but also high enough for producers to, to continue producing. And that's how a buffer stock works, right? It fluctuates so that you're constantly allowing prices to fluctuate within a reasonable limit. We don't allow the price of corn to go to zero in, in a buffer stock. Number two, a buffer stock only works if it's permanent. You can't do a buffer stock mechanism and expect it to work if it's only used three months out of the year or every other year. It has to be a permanent program so that you're constantly monitoring the, the volume of, of output and monitoring the prices. If you don't have the buffer stock, you can't control prices when, when you have these shocks. So we have a buffer stock for all of these commodities because we believe that stabilizing the prices of these commodities is extremely important for stabilizing the economy for protecting, you know, the economy. Let me ask you this. What is what is the minimum wage in the UK? Anybody know? That's, yes, seven, eight. That's for people working. What's the minimum wage for people who are unemployed? Zero. I'm sorry? Something like that, right? But in most other countries where there is no you know, welfare system or very limited welfare system, the minimum wage is zero. That's the effective minimum wage in, in most countries. So we don't allow the price of corn and wheat and coffee and all of these things to go to zero, and yet we allow the price for labor to go to zero. And we don't have a buffer stock mechanism to stabilize the price of labor. And, I mean, as Bill Mitchell says, you know, you put, you know, if corn is unemployed, it doesn't have problems, right? It doesn't get, have depression or commit suicide or domestic violence, all kinds of negative. There's tons of studies in the social sciences linking high levels of unemployment with all kinds of uh, issues, uh, um, public health issues, uh, crime, uh, domestic violence. So that you start adding up the costs the social cost and the monetary cost of having to deal with these social issues. Now, we're not saying that if you eliminate unemployment, all of these problems will go away, but quite a bit of those problems will be tamed and diminished significantly. Right? So that's really, to me, that's a big motivation behind a job guarantee program, that it's socially necessary, it's ethically necessary, and it's economically necessary too. Because we implement the exact same mechanism for other economic variables in the system. When, when the stock market goes through you know, a bubble, central banks intervene to tame the bubble, right? At least they try. When the stock market goes through a crash, central banks intervene to prevent prices of those assets from going to zero. That's a buffer stock of some sort, too. And I, I, I mean, believe me, the, having a buffer stock for labor is way more important than having a buffer stock for corn or coffee or any other commodity for, for a variety of reasons. So what I'm suggesting here is that we have the tools. We know that it's, if anything, it's the most valuable buffer stock mechanism for society. We have plenty of things that need to be done, despite the fact that some people say, well, what are, what are these people going to do? Right? If there's something useful to be done, it would have been done already by the private sector, which is not true. Right? I'll show you some examples. So this is really the idea of the job guarantee, that the government will stand ready to offer a job to anyone who's ready, willing, and able to work 
at that minimum wage plus benefits package plus whatever whatever the government wants to offer. The job guarantee can be as generous as society wants it to be. So this will be a debate in Parliament, debate in Congress in the U.S. Does it? Do we want it to be a minimum wage? Do we want it to be a living wage? Does it have to offer you know healthcare benefits, retirement benefits, childcare benefits? The sky's the limit in terms of the, the possibilities. Uh, and in the case of the U.K., you don't have to worry at least for now, you don't have to worry about the health care benefits, hopefully. Um, and the minimum wage is relatively, with, with the welfare benefits available in the UK, it's a much easier sell than in the US because the US is so far behind in terms of minimum wage, in terms of health care benefits and retirement benefits, child care benefits, all kinds of deficiencies in the, in, in, in the, in the system. Um, so it operates as a, as a buffer stock mechanism. It's counter-cyclical because the buffer stock operates with, against the cycle. So when the private sector is booming, right, there'll be fewer people unemployed, so the size of the buffer stock will be small. But when the private sector goes through a recession, it will lay off quite a few workers. And that's when the employer of last resort, the buffer stock, will absorb the unemployed population. So the size of the buffer stock will fluctuate against the business cycle so that we have permanent full employment. And that's, again, important because you have to have a permanent buffer stock program in order for it to actually work. So the job guarantee ideas that a lot of people circulate and talk about in the media, including the New Deal program, include, if you look at every single country in the world, at some point or another, has some sort of version of job guarantee, but it's not the job guarantee that I'm talking about. It's not a buffer stock. It's usually public works programs or large scale public works programs that are typically implemented during major recessions or great depressions and then very quickly eliminated as soon as the economy goes back to normal, right? Um, because we think we can't afford it, right? That's not a buffer stock. It's temporary. So most public works programs, most things that people describe as job guarantee are actually temporary, um, you know, employment programs, not a buffer stock system. And in many cases, they tend to be, uh, they tend to pay less than a minimum wage. Uh, they, they're, they're temporary in terms of sometimes they're only part-time work. So the case of Argentina, the employment guarantee program that was introduced during their crisis was limited to heads of household, was limited in pay, was limited in number of hours that you could participate was a good example showing that there's plenty that can be done and there's useful, productive things that society can accomplish, but in, in, in terms of it playing a buffer stock role, it, it didn't. Right? Um, so what, what we're talking about is if we're successful in introducing this in a particular country, it will be the first of its kind to be a permanent buffer stock program. India's employment guarantee program, the NREGA program, which is guaranteeing 100 hours of work in rural areas, 100 hours per year. I'm oh, sorry, 100 days per year in rural areas. So it's limited in number of hours and number of days. It's limited in pay. It's limited in the sense that it's only in rural areas, not, not urban areas. A great example is the largest public works program in, uh, in the history of the world, but it's still limited. It's not a job guarantee. Um, in terms of designing the job guarantee, when you think of a large country like the United States, and the political culture of the United States, having a decentralized system is extremely important because people don't want large-scale government bureaucracy. And a large-scale government bureaucracy doesn't make sense because you want local community leaders to define what are the needs of the community. And then based on that, you hire people who have the skills to do those tasks locally. And if the skills are not available, you do on-the-job training. So Minsky used to say, take people as they are, where they are, and do on-the-job training. So this excuse that you hear frequently from, from the private sector that the unemployed are not skilled, they're unemployable, you know, code word unemployable to me translates into women, minorities, people with disabilities, people who went to prison, high school dropouts, people with no experience, and how do you how do you expect the experience to happen if nobody's going to hire individuals who happen to be trapped in that kind of scenario for a variety of reasons, right? So then the burden is shifted on the individuals to somehow, you know, get their act together, 
pay for their training and education, vocational training in the case of the United States. And then maybe we'll hire you because there's no guarantee you get the training and then say, well, your skills are obsolete. That's what we wanted two years ago. Now we want this next thing. So you're, you're constantly not able to, you know, make it into the, the formal and capitalism doesn't generate enough jobs for everyone, right? We've known this from the beginning. So this is just an excuse. I'm, and I'm, I'm a teacher. I'm an educator. So I'm, I'm all for education and skills, but it's not sufficient. Skills and education is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient for finding employment. And we want to lift everybody in the system in terms of skills and education and experiences. But without having a job guarantee, we're condemning a portion of the population to permanent unemployment and with all the negative effects that, that go with it. So in, in the case of the UK, because of a different political culture and size of the country, what I imagine is mostly expanding the existing government services that are run by local councils and municipalities, um, but also relying on some NGOs that are doing good work in the community. If you ask any NGO leader and you look at their resources, they, you, you find that they're understaffed and underfunded. And you say, well, are there good things in the community that can be done that you can't do right now? They say, yeah, if we have more resources, there's plenty more to be done. So then what you can do is offer a, a grant from the national government or from, you know, from the central government or the local municipality to NGOs that says, you know, grant application, tell us what you need to do. How much it will cost? How many people you'll, you'll hire? Do you have the skills? Do you need training for these skills? And you apply for the grant, you get the funding, and then you, you do the implementation, the assessment, and the transparency, everything in the same way nonprofit organizations apply for grants from private foundations, right? So the, the mechanics of it is already there. We're just scaling up the funding so that we can get more things, more things done. Um, so you can think of job guarantee as a two-tier program, possibly. One is a kind of a national program for infrastructure, for research and development, for things that apply in every single town and every single community, especially when it comes to infrastructure. But then there's the very detailed pockets of issues that happen in particular communities that the central government will, will simply not know and not predict and can't replicate across the board because it will be repetitive and, and useless. And that's where you need local municipalities and NGOs to identify those particular issues because they most likely they have the solutions right there. They just don't have the resources to address them or are already addressing them at this level when it needs to be addressed at this level. Um, so these are, this is sort of the, the logistics and different countries will probably have different design, um, uh, design uh, proposals, but this is what I envision large scale and kind of more micro uh, scale uh, interventions. Um, so only the financing comes from the central government, but the logistics of the implementation and management of these programs uh, should be done uh, at the local level. Um, how about the private sector? And this is, this is an issue that comes up a lot. So if, if we have this employment guarantee that offers decent wages and benefits and everything, why would anybody work for Walmart or McDonald's or, you know, precarious labor conditions type of thing? Well, for one, if, if the private sector is not offering the same wage, this becomes the effective minimum wage because everybody will have to compete with that. So if you're a private sector employer, you want to hire workers, and now there are no unemployed people, right? Everybody's employed either in the private sector or in this job guarantee sector. You're going to have to hire them away from their existing job. So you have to offer them at least the same wage, same benefits, if not more, to attract them to your business. And if you're trying to race to the bottom, which is the existing system now, you're not going to be able to do that. So this sets a minimum social standard for society that says, if your business model doesn't work at a socially acceptable minimum standard of wages and benefits and workplace conditions, then your business model is failing and you should be out of business. Right? Just like the arguments against slavery, against emancipation, well, quite a few slave owners said, well, well, we'll be losing a lot of money. We can't, we can't work. Well, your business model is failing. If your business model requires slavery in order to make money, then, then it should be gone, right? 
So I see this, this sort of argument as, as silly that we accept these arguments from the business community that says, well, I can't make money if I have to pay my workers a little bit more, <laughs> and if I have to give them decent working conditions. And somehow we, we got used to accepting this argument, say, well, yeah, yeah, when we have MPs and, and congressmen, representatives sort of on their side saying, well, labor, you need to, you know, take it down a notch and accept your fate. You know, otherwise, what's the alternative? What's the threat? It's unemployment. We'll pack up and leave and outsource and you'll be unemployed, right? Now, we have to shift this narrative also with the business community because when you dig down to the interest of the business owners, they say unemployment acts as a threat so I can keep my workers in check, right? So that they can shape up and stay productive and because they can always lose their job. But it's, a, it's an empty threat because you're threatening them with somebody who's long-term unemployed, maybe defined as unemployable, right? And if the business owner is going to take somebody who's unemployable and train them for six weeks or six months, that costs them money, right? So they will not actually do it. They don't do it. You ask business owners, there's lots of surveys actually now in, in the U.S. and probably other places. Say, would you rather hire, you know, somebody who's unemployed, long-term unemployed, or hire somebody, you know, straight out of college with no experience, or hire somebody who's working for a competitor, or hire somebody, you know, who's unemployed but volunteering in a community organization. So he's active professionally, but not paid. The last person they'll hire is somebody who's been unemployed long-term. The first one they want to hire is somebody who's already working because they're employable already. They have a track record of showing up on time and being productive. They have a reference letter. So this is what the job guarantee will also do. It will provide a pool of employable workers, not unemployable. Which one is more of a threat to me as a worker? Somebody who's unemployable or somebody who's actually working in a job guarantee program has a proving track record of showing up on time and learning skills and keeping up their professional skills. From a business perspective, you're providing me with a pool of ready-to-go workers that I don't have to train as much, that I don't have to, you know, verify and check as much. You're, you're providing me with a, with a ready-to-go pool of labor, right? And if I have to pay a little bit more for it, then it's fair because you're, you've, been, you've been outsourcing the, the cost of trading labor and preparing labor to families and individuals. Right? which was not the case. If you go back to the 60s, employers used to train workers. They used to take them fresh out of high school and train them on the job and pay for the training. Right? The expectation that you should come ready with all the skills and the certificates is a new phenomenon because we've, we've over time we've accepted the fact that, yeah, it's my responsibility. I should, I should go get the training and get in debt to learn skills, professional vocational skills, and have the certificate and then show up and then say, well, we don't actually need you. Or your skills are, you know, uh, obsolete by now. So we have to shift this narrative uh, with, with the business world and empower workers to negotiate accordingly and empower MPs and government officials to learn that there is an alternative, that the, the, this, is not, this is not the way. And when people realize that they have this workable model in place, and they put it in their MPs' faces, in their congressmen faces, and they say, we're gonna vote accordingly. I think we, we're gonna have a, a turning point in this, in this game. And just like, you know, the neoliberals shifted the narrative in the 70s and 80s, they didn't win these debates in academic journals. They won it in the public domain, on the streets, in the media, with a narrative that made sense. Not saying the narrative was, you know, whatever was behind the narrative was right but it's the narrative that won the debate. And we're not gonna win this in academic circles with MMT economists, and it's gonna be won in the public discourse, which is why what's happening in the US the last few days is, is very exciting because it's, it's in the public domain, and people are talking about it left and right, and lots of people are learning about it who had no idea that an alternative proposal was on the table until, until now. So, what kinds of jobs? There's long lists of jobs that can be done. Um, in, in the case of the UK, in the case of the US also, um, lots of care work, lots of environmental work. Um, 
countries that have large productive capacities, we don't need to compete with the private sector by producing cars and widgets and all kinds of things. What we need is to improve quality of life in terms of services to the elderly, healthcare, um, educational services, after school programs, youth development programs, um, and environmental programs. And I, I want to push a little bit on the environmental front here um, in a minute. But I, I have long slides that have examples where people will say well, there's nothing to be done. These are long lists. Some of it applies to the UK, some of it maybe doesn't. But, you know, I have long slides. I just put three here of examples after examples after examples. Um, but here's, here's where people say, well, we're at full employment. This is the, the bars at the bottom. That's the official unemployment numbers in the UK. That's the almost 4%. And then you have to add to it the, those who are unemployed, um, who gave up looking for work or inactive. And then you have to add to it those who are working part time, but would like to be working full time. And if you add up these numbers, the, the unofficial unemployment rate would be triple that number, close to 14%. So even in the public discourse, when we have this narrative about, oh, we're at full employment, it's just 4%. It's very different when we say the unemployment rate is actually 14 percent. If, if people realize it's at 14 percent, if MPs realize or you know are you know forced to think about 14 percent, we'll go into crisis mode. Whereas people are now sort of relaxed and say the economists told us we're at full employment, so we're done, we're good, right? So on the climate front, uh, climate. This is uh, CO2. Uh, this is global temperature change, and most climate scientists tell us that the two degrees is, is the limit. It's not the point of no return. Scientists don't say that, but it's uh, beyond that point, it's, it's uncharted territory. And you can see in the last few years, we're, we're spiraling out of control. Uh, in terms of uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, this is the latest. This is from two weeks ago, uh, three weeks ago, as measured in Hawaii. Most scientists... I mean, for a while they told us 350 is really a good limit, but now we're at 410. So again, we're spiraling out of control when it comes to, to climate. And when, when the planet is on fire and we have millions of people around the world, in this country and beyond, who are involuntarily unemployed, and we have tons of clean technology new technology, high-tech, and even low-tech methods for dealing with the environmental mess. This technology is available and getting cheaper by the day at our fingertips. And we say there's nothing to be done. There's nothing that we can do. It's, it's nonsense. When you put these, these pieces together, the climate crisis, the unemployment masses, and the availability of resources, technological resources, and countries that have full financial sovereignty like the UK, like the US, like Japan, like Australia, like Canada, then you say we're, we have a crisis, but we, we can't afford it. We can afford it from a real resource side. We have the technology and the technology is producible, right? It's not like we have a shortage of technology. We have the labor resources. We have the know-how. We have the financial power of countries that have financial sovereignty. And yet we're told we can't afford these things. And there's nothing to be done anyway. But that's what we're, some people are trying to convince us, that there's, there's nothing we can do. So to conclude, the unemployment is, uh, is a very, unemployment is a very costly feature of capitalism. It breeds so many social and economic problems. Uh, the situation calls for urgent action and bold action. Uh, and the current policies, even in times of high levels of official unemployment, the policies that we use are very weak, they're expensive financially, but at least if they work, we would say, okay, fine. They don't even work. We don't even get to full employment, not even close to full employment. So the, the job guarantee is, is a necessity, and, and I believe that economic justice via a job guarantee, living wage jobs program is possible, desirable, and affordable. And the idea that we have no solutions is, is just unacceptable when, when we have the tools at our disposal.
and I'll stop here and take questions. Thank you. Thank you.